Adventist Fellowship. How are you feeling today? Yeah, good. Are you excited to be here today? I can tell you that I'm excited to be here today. I really like the, the color theme that we're doing today. I, I loved walking in and seeing everybody in the different colors representing their groups. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm repping the green group here, Gen X, okay? You can imagine my horror, though, when I saw Laura wearing a yellow <laughs> shirt. I thought, yep, yellow, yellow, but that millennial? Millennial? I know that the millennials get a bad rap, right? Uh, let, let's face it, millennials have, have, had, a, has, ha, have had a tough go. There's, it seems like everybody now wants to write an article about millennials, but um, I love my wife. She's an amazing person, and all you, all you yellow millennials out there, we love you. Uh, we love all of you. And I think it's amazing for us to come together as a church family and to celebrate the fact that we're all different. Uh, we all have our differences, and yet God has called us all to be part of the same family. Amen. And so I hope you're as excited to be here as I am today. And I will tell you that as excited as I am, I also, it also feels a little bit surreal to me. Um, and the reason is because I'm standing up here today as I have done before, but today I'm standing here in a little bit different context than I've done in the past. And as we've gone on this journey, and it's been full of fear, and it's been full of questions, and it's been full of doubts, it's been full of excitement as well, I just started thinking about some things. And, and as I began thinking about the fact that I'm standing up here, now with the, I guess the title you would say of pastor, it just feels odd. And part of the reason is because, just like I said last week, if you had asked me six months ago, when I think about this journey, it's been, it's been a big week this past week. And really, if I'm being honest, it's been, it's been a big few months for our family. A lot of changes have taken place. And, and as I've thought about this journey, and I said last week, if you had asked me six months ago whether I would be a full-time pastor or whether I would be the pastor of Adventist Fellowship, I would have said, no way. Not a chance. And there's no way that that's going to happen. And, and there are lots of reasons why I might have said, no way. I might have told you that, listen, I'm, I'm not a theologian, um, not by training anyway. I've read a lot and I've studied a lot, but I didn't, I'm, I'm not a seminarian. I didn't go to, to school for this. Or I might tell you, you know, that, um, that this just, well, that's just not the path that I've chosen. You know, I've, I've gone the corporate route and, and that's where I fit and that's what, my, that's what my life is built around. And I could have given you all these reasons for why I would have given, told you that no way answer. All kinds of reasons. I could go on and on. And I would have told you and I would have believed that I'm just, I'm just not a likely candidate for being a full-time pastor. I started thinking about that word likely likely. And I titled my message today, the least likely of these. And the reason I did that is because, you know, I'm thinking about likely and you think about this idea of maybe most likely to succeed. And we're talking about generations today, right? I don't think they do this anymore. It's probably wise if they, if they don't, but, but there was a point in time for many, many years, decades where you'd go, you'd flip through a, a, a yearbook and you'd see a page there that would say most likely to succeed, right? And you'd see a picture there of some young idealistic high school student, um, head caught to one side with the, under the chin, <laughs> smiling, smiling, most likely to succeed. And I thought about what, it, what does that mean? Mo what did they even mean by most likely to succeed? I don't know, it was just this nebulous thing, right? And, but I thought, I thought about this term, least likely, right, for myself, least likely to, to be standing here today in the capacity that I am. And I thought, you know, the Bible is full of a lot of least likely to succeed characters, right? And that's what I want to talk to you about today, the least likely of these. I want to focus 
on the story of Gideon. We're going we're gonna to turn in our Bibles to Judges, and we've got the, the, uh, the verses up on the screen. But Judges chapter 6 is where we first hear about the name Gideon, the person Gideon in the Bible. You can read along with me if you have it. You can look up there at the screen. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the, the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And so I want to pause right there. There's probably a whole other message just in that, in that, in that little, uh, those couple verses of scripture, right? Because we can see something. We see that Gideon is is acquainted with God. He knows who God is. He's heard the stories about God and he's sort of recounting them and going, okay, I hear you, but, but if that's true, if God's really with us, then where is he? So he knows something about God and about his power. Okay. Then the Lord turned to him and said, this is verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And now we see Gideon react or respond again to something that this messenger of the Lord is saying. So he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And I want to focus in on those verses because you see God telling Gideon face to face, go out and you'll save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And he says, have I not sent you? Or another way of saying that is I'm the one sending you. You can have certainty in this because I'm the one sending you. And what does Gideon do? Okay, we've already established that Gideon is someone who knows God. He knows God's power. He knows how God can work. And yet what we see is Gideon responding. I I imagine in the way that many of us might respond in a similar situation. He says, me? How, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest clan. And I'm not only is my clan the weakest clan, but, but even within my father's house, I'm the least. I'm the, I'm the youngest. I'm the puniest. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the one. I'm not the one. And it's interesting to me because I believe that Gideon has a lesson to teach us. This story about Gideon. Because I believe that many of us, in the same way, we tell ourselves these same types of things. God may be calling us to something. I say maybe, I wanna retract that statement. I wanna rewind that and say it again. God is calling us to something. And what I wanna talk about is who are we believing? Who are we trusting in? Okay, in this moment right here, Gideon's got a question. God, you said this about me, But here are these other, here's this other narrative. Here's this other story that's out there. I'm the the least in the clan of the least. How am I going to save Israel? And we're not going to go through the rest of the story of Gideon, not, not, not line by line like we just did. But we know that in the story of Gideon, God goes on to win an absolutely stunning victory. For the children of Israel, right? Gideon takes his 300 men 
and they go out and they defeat the Midianites who have been, the Bible tells us, have been oppressing them, right? They've, been, they've sort of been given over to the Midianites for this time. And I mean, I'm thinking about this and I think, talk about least likely to succeed. Like I'm no military strategist, but Gideon, okay, there's a plan now. Gideon's got these 300 men and God has continually whittled down the number of people that are gonna go fight uh, alongside Gideon. And now he's got these 300 men and I can just imagine, I can just imagine these 300 and they're ready to go. They're like, yes, Gideon, the Lord is with us. We're gonna do this. Gideon, what's the plan? And Gideon was like, okay, guys, you all got a trumpet, right? Yeah, 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 you gave us a trumpet. Okay, here we go. You've got your trumpet. We're gonna go up on that ridge and, and, and we're gonna blow our trumpet really loud. And they're like, okay, okay, yeah, blow the trumpets really loud. And, and, then, and then after we blow the trumpets, we're gonna shout as loud as we can. They're like, yeah, let's shout, let's do it. Yeah, this is awesome. And then, and then we're, gonna, we're gonna break these pots and we're gonna wave our torches in the air. Yeah, awesome, the torches, we're gonna wave them in the air. Well, okay, and then what? And he's like, and then, yeah, that, uh, that should about do it. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine? Yeah, that, that's, 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 all, that's all I got. And then, well, I mean, well, they're going to run away, right? When they see the torches, then they're going to they're gonna run away. I, again, I'm not a military strategist. And yet, when I, I, I'm pretty sure nobody else in the, in the history of the world has based a successful military strategy off of this plan. We're going we're gonna to make a lot of noise and we're going to wave a torch and they're going to run away, okay? And yet, this is the plan that God laid out. This is the plan that God made for success. And I'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why. It's the plan that God made for their success because the plan ultimately wasn't about the Israelites. The plan wasn't ultimately about Gideon. Gideon had a part to play and yet the things that God was doing in Gideon's life were not only for him. There was a greater plan at play, a plan that would ultimately bring God all of the glory for this least likely to succeed military strategy, amen? Now there are other parts of the story that we can look at. We could go to chapter seven, verses nine through 11. God tells Gideon that he needs to go down into the camp of the Midianites because he's gonna go down there and he's gonna hear something that encourages him, that's going to encourage him in the battle. And God tells Gideon, go down there to the camp, but he says this, but if you're afraid, you can take your servant with you. And the Bible doesn't tell us that Gideon was afraid, but if we read just another verse or two down from that, what does it say? So Gideon went down to the camp with his servant. What does that mean? Gideon was afraid. God said, if you're afraid, God said, go down there. I'm telling you to go. But if you're afraid, you can take a friend with you. And then the Bible just, just kind of goes on and we see, and Gideon went down and he took his friend with him. What does that mean? That means that Gideon was afraid. Even after all of these things, Gideon up to this point had, had seen all kinds of miracles from God. He had requested multiple times, God, if you are truly calling me to do this thing, can you please show me? He had, we, we, we all we're, we're familiar with the famous story of the fleece, right? We still use that term today. Like if we're trying to make a big decision, we say, I'm gonna put out a fleece for God. And that comes from this story because Gideon used this fleece as a sign and he asked God, can you please show me? that you're with me. And he's been shown time and time and time again. And yet God is now asking him to do something else. And he's still afraid. But he goes down into the camp with his, ser with his servant. And so I look at that and the question that I have is does any of this sound familiar to any of you? 
it sounds very familiar to me because I think about my life and I think about the ways that I've seen God work over the years. He, above and beyond anything that I could have ever imagined for my life. And yet each, almost each and every time, I can tell you probably almost without fail, that each and every time God calls me into something, he calls me to take that next step. He calls me, he tells me, I'm asking you to do this. I'm calling you to do this. I'm still scared, right? I'm still scared. And I think a lot of that has to do with who we believe, what stories we're believing. But we, but we go beyond this. And what's more, we see God working with Gideon through his doubts, okay? He works with him through his doubts, through his insecurities, and he even tells him, he even puts other people in his life to speak words that will be affirming to him, that will, that will be encouraging to him because he goes down into the camp. What do we, he's, he's got a friend with him because he's still afraid, but he, we told that he goes down into the camp and he overhears two men speaking. And the one man is talking about this dream that he's had about how you know, there's this, there's this weird giant loaf of bread and it's gonna roll in and knock over a tent. And this other guy goes, oh, I know what that is, that's Gideon. God has, has raised him up from the children of Israel and he's gonna come in and he's gonna defeat us. Gideon hears all of this. And what happens? Just like God said, he's strengthened. He's strengthened, right? And we have to be careful with this part of it because we're talking about who we choose to believe who we choose to trust. And, and, and we can't always listen to the stories that other people are telling us. We can't always listen to the narrative that other people wanna tell us about, about our lives, about who we are. And yet in this moment, God had specifically placed someone in Gideon's life that was going to speak words that would encourage him. And the more that I look at the story of Gideon, the more I believe that one of the only differences between him and me or him and us as a group is that he ultimately chose to believe what God said about him. I can almost, I can just imagine, I can almost imagine Gideon standing there. We haven't even talked about the part of the, you know, the beginning of the story that Gideon was hiding out, right? Gideon was threshing the wheat and he was hiding because he was, again, he was afraid. And, and, and God comes to him and he says, oh, you mighty man of valor. And I can almost see Gideon doing one of these of like, like, like who else has discovered me? Like me, me, me him, him, me, me, him, him, no, him, no, me, me, me. And eventually, at some point, Gideon sort of gets his courage up and he's kind of, yes, yes, I am a mighty man of valor, right? I don't, don't ask me why, don't ask me why Gideon sounds like Batman, okay? But Gideon, but, but I believe that, I believe that Gideon at some point is kind of, he's, he, he's nervous, Right? He's nervous, and yet here he is, and, I, and, and eventually he chooses to believe that about himself, and he's, you know, he's sort of steeled himself. He's sort of, and I can identify with that. I can identify with that very much in the current situation that I'm in, because over the past week, I've had multiple people call me pastor, and I sort of look around for Rick. Like, I didn't know Rick was standing right there. What? So if, if, if that happens over the next few weeks and I look like I'm looking around for Rick or you kind of hear me mutter to myself, I, I am a pastor. <laughs> you'll, know, you'll know why, okay? You'll know why. <laughs> the point is the difference between Gideon and, and ourselves, and maybe the difference really isn't that wide, is that he chose to believe what God said about him. It is no different for us 
the same God who through his word, who through his spoken word created the universe, created everything that we see around us. That same God through his word to us tells us in Psalm 134 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He tells us in Ephesians 2.10 that we were created for a purpose. You are not an accident. You are here for a reason. You are here for a reason. The same God who through his word created everything that we see around us says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that the more time you spend with him, the more he will change you into his likeness. He tells you in John 15, 15, that you are his friend. He says in John 3, 16, that you are so incredibly loved that he gave his only son to pay the ransom for you. I love the way that Rick said it last week. Rick talked about this last week and he said, he loves you so much that he emptied all of heaven. He emptied all of heaven for you. And friends, there are so many voices out there trying to tell us what we can't do. What makes us successful or not successful? What gives us our value? What we need to, to do in order to be lovable? What we have to be like to be a Christian? Right? There's so many voices out there. But today and every day we have a choice as to who we believe. All kinds of people will try to tell you that they know you better than you know yourself. Our culture will try to tell you who you are, but there's only one source of truth when it comes to knowing you better than you know yourself, and that is the one who created you. It makes me think of the question that, that God asked Adam and Eve um, after they had sinned and he came to find them in the garden. He asked them where they had been. And they said, well, we're hiding because, because we, we realized that we were naked. What did, God, what did God say to them when they said that? Who told you that? Who told you that? Because God knew that Adam and Eve hadn't been naked. They had been clothed in light. They had been exactly the way that he had created them to be. And yet he had to ask them this question because in that moment, they had chosen to believe what someone else had said about them. Who told you that? And sometimes the voice that we choose to listen to can be our own voice. It can be our own voice telling us that we're not good enough, that we're not brave enough, that we're not successful enough, that we're not worthy enough. And I can hear God asking us the same question today. He's asking us the same question. Who told you that? Who said that to you? Was it me? the one who created you, the one who has told you in your word that I designed you for a purpose? No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me who said that to you. So who told you that? I can hear him. I can hear him asking those questions. If you feel today like you're one of the least likely of these, one of the least likely to succeed, maybe you feel like, you're the least likely to invite a friend to church or to Bible study. Maybe you feel like you're the least likely to overcome that addiction that you've been struggling with for years. You feel like you're the least likely to leave that unhealthy relationship behind. You're the least likely to find love again if you do choose to leave that relationship behind. Maybe you're telling yourself that you're the least likely to, 
to stand up for someone else. Maybe you're the least likely to become a pastor. I can tell you today, friends, that you are in good company. And church, I wanna challenge you today. I wanna challenge you when you leave this place, whether it's today or throughout this week, I'm gonna challenge you to, to, to do this, to start simple with one prayer, but I believe that this is something that you should do daily. I challenge you to ask God to reveal to you, to search you, and to reveal to you the areas where you've chosen to believe someone other than him. It doesn't matter whether it's your parents, it doesn't matter whether that's a teacher, it doesn't matter whether it's yourself. Ask him to reveal to you those areas in your life where you have chosen to believe someone other than him. Amen. You've chosen to believe something other than what he says about you and who he says you are and the purpose that he has placed on your life. And once he's done that, once he's revealed that to you, keep on praying. Once he's revealed that to you, Keep praying that he'll give you the courage to believe what he says about you. Amen. And once he's done that and your courage is up, and now I am the mighty man of valor, Amen. right? Once that courage is up, ask him to give you the strength to walk in that calling that he has given you. Because if you do those things, I believe that your story will be his glory. Amen? Amen? Because I said earlier that the things that God is calling us to do in our lives, the things that he's empowering us to do, they're not just for us. God wasn't looking just to help Gideon feel a little bit better about himself because he was kind of down in the dumps about being the least of the least. He wanted to deliver a whole nation. Friends, God has placed a calling on your life and it's not just for you. Believe what God says about you. Let, his, let your story become his glory. And so I ask you, friends, who do you choose to believe today? God bless you.